Hello friends and welcome. Today we will be discussing refrigeration. Let us first try to understand the basis of refrigeration. Refrigeration or cold storage of food is a gentle method of food preservation. It involves removal of heat from food products so that their temperature is first lowered and then maintained at low temperature compared to that of the surroundings. Molecular mobility is reduced and consequently chemical reactions and biological processes are slowed down at low temperature. Low temperature practically does not destroy microorganisms or enzymes but merely depresses their activity. Therefore, refrigeration retards spoilage but it cannot improve the initial quality of the product. Hence, it is important to assure high microbial quality in the starting material. Maintaining temperatures lower than ambient inside the system requires both the removal of heat and prevention of penetration of heat through the system's boundaries. The transfer of heat is accomplished by using a refrigerant which like water changes state from liquid to vapor. Now let us see how refrigeration is expressed. Since refrigeration is based on the rate of removal of heat, the unit of refrigeration effect is watt or kilowatt. The standard unit of refrigeration is ton of refrigeration denoted as TR. 1 TR is equivalent to the production of cold at the rate at which heat is to be removed from 1 ton of water at 0 degree Celsius in 24 hours. There are various types of refrigeration systems such as non-cyclic, cyclic and others. Now first non-cyclic refrigeration systems. These systems include ice refrigeration, refrigeration by evaporation and refrigeration by dry ice. These systems were used before the invention of cyclic refrigeration systems. Second is cyclic refrigeration systems. These include the air refrigeration cycle, vapor compression refrigeration cycle and vapor absorption cycle. And third, other refrigeration systems. These are thermoelectric refrigeration cycle, steam jet refrigeration cycle, vortex tube refrigeration system, etc. We now move towards the principle of operation of a refrigerator. Mechanical refrigeration systems are based on the operation of a simple heat pump working on the compression of vapor. A refrigeration system may be considered as a pump that conveys heat from a region of low temperature to another region that is at a high temperature. The low temperature side of a refrigeration system is maintained at a lower temperature than the system it is cooling to allow spontaneous heat flow into the refrigeration system. The high temperature side must have a temperature higher than ambient to allow dissipation of the absorbed heat to the surroundings. Maintaining a high and a low temperature in a refrigeration system is made possible by the use of a refrigerant fluid that is continuously recirculated through the system. Now, let us discuss the components of a refrigeration system. Major components of a simple mechanical vapor compression refrigeration system include evaporator, compressor, condenser and expansion valve. As the refrigerant flows through these components, its phase changes from liquid to gas and then back to liquid. The flow of refrigerant can be examined by tracing the path of the refrigerant. At location D on the figure, the refrigerant is in a saturated liquid state. The expansion valve separates the high pressure region from the low pressure region. After passing through the expansion valve, the refrigerant experiences a drop in pressure and temperature. Due to the drop in pressure, some of the liquid refrigerant changes to gas. The liquid gas mixture leaving the expansion valve is termed flash gas. The liquid gas mixture enters the evaporator coils at location E. In the evaporator, the refrigerant completely vaporizes to gas by accepting heat from the media surrounding the evaporator coils. The saturated vapors may reach a superheated stage due to gain of additional heat from the surroundings. The saturated or superheated vapors enter the compressor at location A, where the refrigerant is compressed to a high pressure. 
as the pressure of the refrigerant increases, the temperature increases and the refrigerant becomes superheated as shown by location B. The superheated vapors are then conveyed to a condenser. Using either an air cooled or a water cooled condenser, the refrigerant discharges heat to the surrounding media. The refrigerant condenses back to the liquid state in the condenser as shown by location D. After the entire amount of refrigerant has been converted to saturated liquid, the temperature of the refrigerant may decrease below that of its condensation temperature due to additional heat discharge to the surrounding media. In other words, it may be subcooled. The subcooled or saturated liquid then enters the expansion valve and the cycle continues. Now let us briefly discuss each component. First the evaporator. The evaporator forms a freezing cabinet in a plate or blast freezer and the ice box or freezing compartment of a domestic refrigerator. Refrigerant circulates through the pipework on the surface of the compartment walls or within the hollow walls and evaporates, thereby absorbing heat at rate Q2 from within the freezer cabinet. Inside the evaporator, the liquid refrigerant vaporizes to a gaseous state. The change of state requires latent heat, which is extracted from the surroundings. Direct expansion evaporators allow the refrigerant to vaporize inside the evaporator coils. The coils are in direct contact with the object of fluid being refrigerated. Indirect expansion evaporators involve the use of a carrier medium, such as water or brine. Now compressor. The compressor has two functions. It pumps refrigerant around the circuit by drawing the vapor out of the evaporator, compressing it and discharging it at a higher pressure into the next component of the system. Second, by running at constant speed and capacity, the compressor helps to maintain a constant pressure and therefore a constant temperature in the evaporator. The refrigerant enters the compressor in a vapor state at low pressure and temperature. The compressor raises the pressure and temperature of the refrigerant sufficiently above the ambient temperature surrounding the condenser. The temperature gradient between the refrigerant and the ambient promotes the heat flow from the refrigerant to the ambient. The three common types of compressors are reciprocating, centrifugal and rotary. After that, the condenser. The condenser enables the warm refrigerant vapor to reject a quantity of heat Q1 to a heat sink at a temperature lower than itself. For the domestic refrigerator, the ambient air in a kitchen is cool enough to achieve this condensation and the condenser consists simply of an exposed length of tubing. In an industrial freezer, however, a water-cooled condenser is used. The function of the condenser in a refrigeration system is to transfer heat from the refrigerant to another medium such as air and or water. By rejecting heat, the gaseous refrigerant condenses to liquid inside the condenser. The major types of condensers used are water-cooled, air-cooled and evaporative. After this, the expansion valve. The purpose of this valve is to control or constrict the flow of liquid refrigerant between the condenser and the evaporator and by maintaining a pressure difference between the two components, control the evaporating pressure and temperature. An expansion valve is essentially a metering device that controls the flow of liquid refrigerant to an evaporator. The valve can be operated either manually or by sensing pressure or temperature at another desired location in the refrigeration system. Now coming to the thermodynamic aspect of refrigeration which involves the pressure enthalpy charts. Charts or diagrams have been used extensively in the literature to present thermodynamic properties of refrigerants. Most commonly used charts depict enthalpy and pressure values on the x and y axis respectively. Another type of chart involves entropy and temperature values plotted along x and y axis respectively. A skeleton description of the pressure enthalpy chart is given in figure. Pressure is plotted on a logarithmic scale on the vertical axis 
and enthalpy on the horizontal axis. The pressure enthalpy chart may be divided into different regions based on saturated liquid and saturated vapor curves. The area enclosed by the bell-shaped curve represents a two-phase region of both liquid and vapor refrigerant. The horizontal lines extending across the chart are constant pressure lines. The temperature lines are horizontal within the bell-shaped area, vertical in the subcooled liquid region and skewed downward in the superheated region. The area on the left-hand side of the saturated liquid curve denotes subcooled liquid refrigerant with temperatures below the saturation temperature for a corresponding pressure. The area to the right-hand side of the dry saturated vapor curve depicts the region where the refrigerant vapors are at superheated temperatures above the saturation temperature of the vapor at the corresponding pressure. Let us consider a simple vapor compression refrigeration system where the refrigerant enters the expansion valve as saturated liquid and leaves the evaporator as saturated vapor. Such a system is shown on a pressure enthalpy diagram in the figure. As dry saturated vapor enters the compressor, the condition of refrigerant is represented by location A. The refrigerant vapors are at pressure P1 and enthalpy H2. During the compression stroke, the vapors are compressed isentropically or at constant entropy to pressure P2. Location B is in the superheated vapor region. The enthalpy of the refrigerant increases from H2 to H3 during the compression process. In the condenser, first the superheat is removed in the desuperheated section of the condenser and then the latent heat of condensation is removed from C to D. The saturated liquid enters the expansion valve at location D. As refrigerant moves through the expansion valve, the pressure drops to P1 where the enthalpy remains constant at H1. Some flashing of the refrigerant occurs within the expansion valve and as a result, location E indicates refrigerant containing liquid as well as vapor. The liquid vapor mix of refrigerant accepts heat in the evaporator and converts completely to the vapor phase. The evaporator section is represented by the horizontal line from location E to A. The pressure remains constant at P1 and the enthalpy of the refrigerant increases from H1 to H2. Now let us discuss what the refrigerant is. There are particular chemical, physical and thermodynamic properties that make a fluid suitable for use as a refrigerant such as suitable freezing and boiling points, high latent heat of vaporization, high condensing pressure, low freezing temperature than evaporator, high critical temperature, non-toxic, non-flammable, non-corrosive, chemically stable, leak detectable, low cost and environment friendly. The most extensively used refrigerants in recent years have been the chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs. The ideal refrigerant widely used in domestic refrigerators until very recently is dichlorodifluoromethane or R12. R12 is completely safe in that it is non-toxic, non-flammable and non-explosive. It is highly stable and is difficult to decompose even under extreme operating conditions. However, CFCs are now known to cause depletion of the ozone layer and since the Montreal Protocol of 1987 have been phased out of use. Alternatives to the CFCs are hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs and hydrochlorofluorocarbons, HCFCs. Hydrogen containing fluorocarbons have weak carbon hydrogen bonds which are more susceptible to cleavage. Thus, they are postulated to have shorter lifetimes. We now move towards the analysis of vapor compression refrigeration. First, the cooling load. The cooling load is the rate of heat energy removal from a given space or object in order to lower the temperature of that space or object to a desired level. Now, work done in the refrigeration cycle. First, in the compressor. 
the work done on the refrigerant during the isentropic compression step can be calculated from the enthalpy rise of the refrigerant and the refrigerant flow rate. Qw is equal to m star into H3 minus H2, where m star is the refrigerant mass flow rate, H3 is the enthalpy of refrigerant at the end of compression stroke, H2 is the enthalpy of refrigerant at the beginning of compression stroke, and Qw is the rate of work done on the refrigerant. Then in the condenser. Within the condenser, the refrigerant is cooled at constant pressure. The heat rejected to the environment can be expressed as Qc is equal to m star into H3 minus H1, where Qc is rate of heat exchanged in the condenser and H1 is the enthalpy of refrigerant at exit from the condenser, then in the evaporator. Within the evaporator, the refrigerant changes phase from liquid to vapor and accepts heat from the surroundings at constant pressure. The enthalpy difference of the refrigerant between the inlet and the outlet locations of an evaporator is called the refrigeration effect. The rate of heat accepted by the refrigerant as it undergoes evaporation process in the evaporator is given by Qe is equal to m star into H2 minus H1, where Qe is the rate of heat exchanged in the evaporator and the refrigeration effect is H2 minus H1. After this comes coefficient of performance. The performance of a refrigeration system is measured by the ratio of the useful refrigeration effect obtained from the system to the work expended on it to produce that effect. This ratio is called the coefficient of performance. It is used to indicate the efficiency of the system. The coefficient of performance denoted as COP is defined as a ratio between the heat absorbed by the refrigerant as it flows through the evaporator to the heat equivalence of the energy supplied to the compressor. COP is equal to H2 minus H1 divided by H3 minus H2. Refrigerant flow rate. The refrigerant flow rate depends on the total cooling load imposed on the system and the refrigeration effect. The following expression is used to determine the refrigerant flow rate. M star is equal to Q divided by H2 minus H1, where M star is the refrigerant flow rate and Q is the total cooling load rate. Now we will talk about how refrigeration affects the food. Refrigeration affects the food during storage. Let us see how. Too low refrigeration temperature can cause damage called chill injury to fruits and vegetables even when these are not physically damaged by freezing. This is not surprising since living plants would be expected to have optimum temperature requirements just as animals do. In the case of bananas and tomatoes on the other hand, Storage temperatures below about 13 degrees centigrade slow down the activities of natural ripening enzymes and result in poor colors. Refrigerated storage permits exchange of flavors between many foods. Butter and milk will absorb odors from fish and fruit, and eggs will absorb odors from onions. It is best to store different foods, especially odorous ones, separately but this is not always economically feasible. Other common changes during refrigerated storage involve loss of firmness and crispness in fruits and vegetables, changes in the colors of red meats, oxidation of fats, softening of the tissues and drippage from fish, staling of bread and cake, lumping and caking of granular foods, losses of flavor and a host of microbial deteriorations often unique to a specific food and caused by the dominance of a particular spoilage organism. Now let us talk about the applications of refrigeration. First, storage of raw fruits and vegetables. The shelf life of most of the fruits and vegetables increases by storage at temperatures between 0 to 10 degrees centigrade. Nuts, dried fruits and pulses that are prone to bacterial deterioration can also be stored for long periods by this method. These fruits and vegetables can be stored in raw state. 
some highly perishable items require initial processing before storage. The fast and busy modern day life demands ready to eat frozen or refrigerated food packages to eliminate the preparation and cooking time. These items are becoming very popular and these require refrigeration plants. Second, meat and poultry. These items also require refrigeration right after slaughter during processing and packaging. Short term storage is done at zero degree centigrade. Long term storage requires freezing and storage at minus 25 degree centigrade. Third, dairy products. The important dairy products are milk, butter, buttermilk and ice cream. To maintain good quality, the milk is cooled in bulk milk coolers immediately after being taken from cows. Buttermilk, curd and cottage cheese are stored at 4 to 10 degree centigrade for increase of shelf life. Use of refrigeration during manufacture of these items also increases their shelf life. Fourth, beverages. Production of beer, wine and concentrated fruit juices require refrigeration. The taste of many drinks can be improved by serving them cold or by adding ice to them. That is all about refrigeration. Hope you have understood it well. Thank you and goodbye.